Welcome everybody to the ISS corporate webinar series and the webinar today, North Korea, a deceptive lull. Tensions on the Korean Peninsula flared the past few months following North's latest nuclear test and US-South Korean military exercises. Tougher UN sanctions triggered louder than usual saber rattling by Pyongyang, including the deployment of medium range missiles to the East Coast. Those mild missiles apparently have now been withdrawn and the tension has for the moment subsided. There is no reason, however, to expect an end to provocations. This year is of course not the first time that North Korea's behavior has alarmed the region. The latest messaging, however, from Pyongyang yields a number of new insights into the outlook and decision making of the North Korean state under its new young leader, Kim Jong-un. The responses of regional states, including China, also show an evolution in policy that informs our view of regional dynamics and trends. To discuss uh, these topics, uh, I have with my, me my colleague, uh, Mark Fitzpatrick. Mark is the director of the Non-Proliferation and Disarmament Program here at ISS. He will speak initially for about 15 to 20 minutes, and then we will open up for questions. If you wish to ask a question, the easiest way is to do so using the chat function. You can reply to the message that I will send you in just a moment, if, I, if it hasn't gone out already. Uh, and, and we will proceed on that basis. So, without further ado, I will hand over to Mark. I've paid a lot of attention to North Korea over the last half a year, particularly during that five-month period of escalating tension and over-the-top rhetoric from December to April, what one U.S. think tank this week termed the hot air war of 2013. Uh, the Korean Peninsula is now in what the Pentagon spokesman called a provocation pause. Now, if we're lucky, boy general Kim Jong-un will now turn attention to the economy and give the reformist he brought back in as prime minister a chance to prove his smarts. But just as likely, the coming year will see more provocations from North Korea with a continued risk of larger conflict. The latest news from North Korea was the firing three days in a row from Sunday through Tuesday of what South Korea called projectiles launched off North Korea's east coast. These were much less powerful than what had been expected to be fired from the east coast. A projectile is a generic term for rockets, missiles, and artillery. And to the layman, the word may not fully convey the lethality of what was tested. Apparently using a new multiple rocket launcher, a 300 millimeter projectiles uh, were tested that flew 150 kilometers. Now 150 kilometers is a far cry from the up to 4,000 kilometer estimated range of the nuclear capable Musudan missiles that were deployed to the east coast in early April and that were widely expected to be tested for the first time as the next act in the escalation drama. When the Musudans were not tested, and then were reportedly withdrawn, there was a collective sigh of relief. Tensions abated also with the end of the annual large-scale U.S.-South Korea military exercise Eagle Fall, hence the claimed provocation pause. Some important caveats must be kept in mind, however. For one, it's not clear that the Musudans really were withdrawn. The media conclusion that they were brought back away from the East Coast was based on a halt of telemetry transmitted from the missiles. It's possible that the transmissions were simply turned off and that the Musudan missiles may still be launched later in the year when they are less anticipated. Jeffrey Lewis, who writes a, a very uh, well-read blog, armscontrolwalk.com, uh, leans toward this hypothesis calling it the jerking our chain uh, scenario. Now, secondly, a uh, second caveat is that for South Korea, the new uh, MRLs, uh, multiple rocket launchers, are more militarily significant than the Musudan. Because after all, South Korea, as well as Japan, are already within range of proven North Korean ballistic missiles. The Scud Bs and Cs with 300 and 500 kilometer range, respectively and the Nodong that can fire a one kiloton warhead 900 kilometers. 
A newer variant of the Nodon paraded in 2010 and similar in appearance to tested Iranian missiles extends the range to 1,600 kilometers. So South Korea is already uh, well uh, covered by uh, North Korean ballistic missiles. It uh, doesn't have to uh, 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 fear a longer range missile. It can already been hit. Now what about that longer range missile, the Musudan? The IISS strategic dossier on North Korea published two years ago assessed that the Musudan has a range of 2,600 kilometers. The United States government, which has access to more information than we have and based on other unstated assumptions, estimates that it can fly perhaps 4,000 kilometers, which would put Guam in range. It would be suicidal, of course, for North Korea to attack Guam, but to take precautions politically as much as militarily. The Pentagon said that a terminal high-altitude area defense ballistic missile system would be sent to the island and that 14 additional ground-based missile interceptors would de deploy to Alaska to accompany the existing 30 there and in California. U.S. ballistic missile defenses also include Aegis ship-based systems. If North Korea fired uh, a missile at Guam, the trajectory would immediately be detected and missile defenses uh, would kick in. Now, if a Musudan that was fired managed to escape being hit, it probably would not itself manage to hit Guam given the inaccuracy of North Korea's missiles. But if by chance Guam was hit, the retaliation would be massive. North Koreans are strange in many ways, but they're not suicidal. They're not crazy. North Koreans are willing, however, to take smaller risks. Hence the significance of the new 300 millimeter uh, multiple uh, rocket launcher. To date, North Korea's most lethal conventional rockets have a maximum range, range of about 60 kilometers. Now these existing systems threaten central Seoul, whose northern suburbs are only 10 kilometers away from the DMZ. So adding but, but adding 300 millimeter MRLs to North Korea's inventory will bring the entire capital region into range. Uh, for example, North Korea uh, uh, will now be able to fire artillery south of the Han River, uh, or Gangnam as it's called in Korean. <laughs> but nobody's dancing to the, uh, the Gangnam style weapon. In its hot war this winter, Pyongyang threatened, as often in the past, to turn Seoul into a sea of fire in retaliation for any attack on North Korea. This threat is an exaggeration. Within minutes of any attack from North Korean artillery pieces, South Korean uh, counter batteries would begin to silence them. But even a short bombardment would be disastrous. It would likely cause a civilian exodus from the capital that would clog roads and hinder South Korean military maneuverability. Now there's no reason to think that North Korea would initiate hostilities by bombing Seoul. North Korea's blood-curdling threats, often not reported in full, are almost always conditional. They say if provoked, North Korea will do this or that. They'll break the wastes of the enemies. They'll cut their windpipes. But leaving aside the rhetorical flashes, it's not hard to imagine scenarios in which the conditionality could come into play. The most probable scenarios would start with a small-scale incident in disputed waters west of the DMZ. For example, North Korea might seize or sink a South Korean crabbing boat. This doesn't require too much imagination, given that North Koreans even seized a Chinese fishing vessel earlier this month and held it 16-man crew captive for over two weeks, demanding ransom. And there have been frequent clashes between North and South Korea over the past dozen years, most uh, frequent naval clashes, most recently in 2010, when North Korea sank the uh, Corvette Chonan and later shelled Yongpyeon Island, together killing 50 South Koreans. The Seoul government faced internal criticism for not responding uh, forcefully in kind. So to, restore, to, so to restore deterrence, the Imyeongbok government said that next time this happens, if it does, 
it would respond very strongly, including maybe with airstrikes. The impression was that it would not only respond with an eye for an eye, but maybe two eyes for an eye. And last month, newly elected President Park yun hae authorized the military to retaliate immediately against any provocation. A tit-for-tat escalation could then ensue, especially if North Korea thinks nuclear weapons give it escalation dominance. North Korean brinksmanship today already may, be, may reflect a sense that South Korea will give in earlier because it has more to lose. Built up real estate with thousands of high-rise buildings, a key stock market, among other valuable assets. The North Korea regime, of course, has its very existence to lose if conflict uh, got to that scale. So Kim Jong-un probably would not carry out a conflict to the nth degree. But over the years, more worldly leaders have undertaken worse gambles. There are alternative, alternative positive scenarios um, that are worth um, also discussing. In April, Kim Jong-un brought back to the Prime Minister's office the so-called reformer, Pak Pongju, who served in this position from 2003 to 2007 during a time of limited economic experimentation. At the same time, the leadership in North Korea said that nuclear and missile programs should serve as a means of supporting economic development and foreign trade and investment. Uh, this was right uh, uh, at the time that they uh, did other things to stop foreign trade. But Kim seems to think that he can give priority to both guns and butter at the same time. Maybe his Swiss schooling will kick in and he'll recognize the contradiction. Maybe he will also learn some economics from China. This week, Kim sent an emissary to Beijing, Vice Marshal Che Ryong-hae, the political commissar of the military. Che's message was probably to ask China to overturn the sanctions it imposed earlier this month on North Korea. China often gets criticized by the West for not uh, doing enough to put pressure on North Korea, but uh, going beyond the requirements of the latest UN Security Council resolution, which was enacted in March after North Korea's third nuclear test, China this month severed accounts with North Korea's foreign trade bank. Several other North Korean bank outlets in China also reportedly had accounts closed. This followed moves by the U.S. and Japan to deny North Korea's foreign trade bank access to their financial systems. Now, in response to any uh, importunings from uh, Vice Marshal uh, Che, China may suggest that the Kaesong Joint Industrial Zone be reopened. Among North Korea's provocative acts this spring, uh, in addition to uh, restoring the plutonium production capability uh, to increase its nuclear weapons arsenal, was closing Kaesong. This eliminated the last significant form of cooperation between the two Koreas. The North Korean state media hinted that the closure was to spite predictions by South Korean media analysts that Pyongyang would not deprive itself of the $90 million annual hard currency earnings. Uh, it's almost as though they're saying, oh yeah, well we'll deny ourselves the $90 million if you think it's so important to us. Uh, a North Korean um, recently uh, told me that um, Kaesong may reopen, but I wonder. There are signs that the decision to close Kaesong was not because of some sudden uh, burst of anger but that it had been planned some two months in advance. The North Korean military may have seen Kaesong as a poison pill. Well, which it was, really. It was an insidious way of introducing dangerous foreign ideas and information into North Korea. The 53,000 North Korean workers there had the best jobs in the country and anyone associated with them by multiple de degrees of separation knew it. The choco pie treats that the workers were provided as a means of supplementing the wages that the state 
uh, mostly confiscated, were never eaten by the workers themselves. Instead, they became the currency for small-scale bribery throughout the country. Kaesong also served to restrain military hotheads, as Britain's leading North Korea expert Aidan Foster Carter put it in a uh, commentary this week. Without this restraining influence, provocations may be even likelier. Kaesong's closing represented the insolvable contradictions of North Korea. The nation can't escape its poverty trap without reform and foreign investment. Yet the regime believes it cannot afford to risk the foreign influence that this would bring. So Vice Marshal Che would not have been too receptive to any Chinese advice to open Kaesong. He represents, in his thinking and in his uniform, North Korea's underlying state policy of military first. North Korea is the most militarized country in the world. It's got the world's fourth largest army, the third largest chemical weapons arsenal, it's got nuclear weapons, it's got several kinds of missiles, it's got the world's largest special operations forces. This military first policy, this militarized society, is another reason why I don't think we've seen the last of the provocations. Mark, thank you very much. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, I have a few questions uh, while others uh, gather their own thoughts. If you would like to ask a question, as I say, easiest ways to use the chat function, you can alternatively raise your hand and then I will unmute your mic, but chat is certainly easier. Mark, in terms of, of nuclear doctrine, a difficult question uh, for us to, to get a handle on, but I wonder if you could shed any, any light on, on what North Korean thinking about nuclear weapons and their potential use might be. I mean, beyond the public statements, you, you mentioned that uh, they think it might give them escalation dominance, um, but, but beyond that, is, is there anything to be said with any confidence about what North Korea thinks about nuclear weapons and their utility? Oh, I don't think we can say with any confidence that we know what North Korea thinks, um, but we can draw some uh, assessments and uh, the logic of the situation, I think, uh, um, gives reason to believe uh, North Koreans when they insist that their nuclear weapons are only for defense and deterrence purposes. Uh, it would be completely suicidal for North Korea to use nuclear weapons uh, except uh, in defense of the regime, in the ultimate defense of the regime. They wouldn't uh, use them to attack uh, uh, Japan or, or U.S. bases in Japan or South Korea unless they felt that this was the uh, necessary in the um, in the event of, uh, of an attack on, on themselves. But it's uh, it's possible to imagine scenarios where North Korea thought it was under a dire attack, and this is uh, in this uh, escalation scenario that I um, uh, one. Um, one rendition of which I elaborated, uh, something that starts small in the West Sea, uh, tit-for-tat escalation ensues. North Korea thinks it has escalation dominance and uh, goes one better. South Korea tries to restore a sense of deterrence and uh, it keeps up the pressure. The United States, which is very worried about such scenarios, uh, tries to um, uh, restrain uh, and keep uh, 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 things cool. Um, is drawn into it perhaps itself or is not able to and um, there's a step across the border by South Korean forces not designed to topple the regime but how would North Korea not uh, know that uh, and they might in those circumstances use nuclear weapons um, uh, use one of them for example as a warning shot but uh, uh, one use of a nuclear weapon will totally change the scenario we talk about a game changer so uh, even though that might not be North Korea's nuclear doctrine, you know, we can't be sure, um, I think that's a, a, a possible scenario. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, another one. Why did Kim engage in all the provocations earlier in the year? How would you explain his recent behavior? Yeah, that's a good question. And again, uh, who knows? Um, but I think we can say that North Korea's own excuse uh, uh, doesn't pass the logic test. North Korea says it had to do all this because it was facing uh, 
uh, imminent potential threat by the United States and its uh, quote South Korean puppets. Uh, the joint U.S. ROK military exercise which brought 10,000 U.S. forces to the peninsula uh, was uh, characterized by North Korea as a provocation and they had to stand up to this. Now, that that's, doesn't pass the logic test because it's an annual exercise and it never results in an attack and it's forecast to the North Koreans. Um, the uh, dates and, uh, are, are, are told to them in advance. But um, the uh, the related uh, reasoning might uh, be that Kim Jong-un, uh, a new untested leader, uh, potentially facing uh, some discontent. We don't know whether there's discontent or not, but there's been um, a remarkable degree of shuffling of key uh, generals and a, uh, a shifting, shifting of, of some of the the control over economic resources, uh, taking uh, some of that away from the military and giving it to the party. So there's there's a potential for uh, unrest and and uh, anger in the ranks. And uh, dictators throughout history have used the foreign threat as a way of of quelling dissent, of uh, garnering uh, national unity in the face of an imminent threat. And I think this is one uh, very probable reason that. Kim Jong-un was engaging in these provocations. Uh, a second uh, reason is that um, there's a pattern that when, North, when South Korea has a new president, that president gets tested. And uh, uh, this, I think, uh, represented a testing of Park Yun-hye. Now, it was, um, I think uh, if that was the case, it was um, uh, very uh, foolish of North Korea because she came uh, into power, having run on a political uh, platform of so-called trust politique. Uh, it's, um, you know, it's a slogan, I don't know exactly what it means, but it, it meant she wasn't uh, Im young bok She was willing to engage with North Korea. She was willing to uh, decouple humanitarian aid from the uh, nuclear issue. And uh, there was every reason for North Korea to take her at her word and to uh, try to uh, um, restore an engagement. But they cut the, cut the legs out from under her feet by, before she even came into power by um, engaging in such provocations and gave her very little reason to uh, continue that uh, trust politic. A third reason for North Korea's provocations is that, uh, again, as part of a tried and true pattern, they wanted something for it. Uh, North Korea has a pattern of, of um, engaging in bad behavior and then asking to be paid to stop it. And uh, it's a bribe, uh, a blackmail that often has worked in the past. So what is it they wanted this time? Maybe uh, they wanted um, uh, some economic assistance from the United States, as has been forthcoming. But what they say they wanted, and I think this is probably true, they wanted uh, talks with the United States. They insist that uh, they want talks to uh, provide for a peace treaty to end formally the Korean War, which uh, has uh, been only in, under a ceasefire through the armistice prevailing since 1953. Uh, now, the United States um, has, at times in the past, been ready to discuss a peace treaty, but only if South Korea is a, uh, has an equal seat at the table. And that's something North Korea never wants. They, they always want to relegate uh, the South to a back bench if they want them there at all. And uh, now with North Korea having tested nuclear devices, the United States and South Korea and Japan are reluctant to uh, enter into talks that would be uh, seen as according uh, nuclear arms status to North Korea, to accepting its uh, nuclear status. So that represents a, a new problem. And uh, it's why the United States has a policy of so-called strategic patience not to give in to North Korean demands or, or blackmail, to insist that North Korea um, carry out um, concrete steps in uh, the direction of denuclearization uh, as a condition for engaging in talks. Uh, North Korea uh, doesn't accept the denuclearization goal anymore. It uh, has rejected all previous pledges of denuclearization and wants talks without conditions. Uh, leading to 
uh, a peace treaty, and that's just not going to happen under the current circumstances. The um, U.S. basketball player uh, Dennis Rodman, who went to North Korea uh, last uh, August and uh, said that, um, that Kim Jong Un wanted uh, President Obama to call him, just call him. Uh, well, uh, that's not going to happen. <laughs> Uh, Mark, thank you. Um, regarding China, uh, the the, move, the moves beyond UN sanctions, uh, could you say a little bit, bit more about that? Do you read this as a step change in Chinese policy? Was it a trial balloon? Is it something that they partially walked back since? Um, what is your reading of it? China's uh, closing of the accounts with uh, North Korea's uh, foreign exchange bank was unexpected. Uh, it was a real surprise because it goes well beyond the rhetorical signals that China had been sending. They had been expressing displeasure and uh, frustration with North Korea in various uh, statements that became less and less veiled. Uh, Chinese academics were more and more expressing in the pages of, uh, of, of Chinese media that North Korea had become uh, more of a liability than an asset to China. Uh, but uh, there was a, a belief, and I still think it's true, that, that China it has not, it, it's not going to change its fundamental policy of protecting North Korea because it sees North Korea as providing an important buffer uh, on China's border between China and uh, the United States and its allies. And because any uh, fall of the any any pressure uh, on North Korea could uh, push the North Korean ed, uh, regime over the edge, uh, resulting in collapse, uh, which uh, not only would uh, remove the buffer but which would uh, uh, entail a flood of refugees into China, which uh, could undermine Chinese stability in an important border area. And China values nothing more and stability among its uh, borders. So I think for those reasons we won't see a sea change in China's policy. But we did see a very important uh, step by China to probably teach North Korea a lesson. And uh, that, uh, that lesson, um, if it is learned and if North Korea takes appropriate steps and offers the appropriate apologies, I think we may see overturned. Or if not overturned in word, will be overturned in deed. Mm -hmm. uh, China has, over the years, signed up to many sanctions which are not implemented uh, fully in practice, and that is likely uh, to be what happens. But I was proven wrong about the uh, Bank of, 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 of Foreign Trade um, cutoff, so we'll see. Okay. Mark, to follow up on that, does North Korea do apologies? <laughs> not in public, uh, uh, never uh, reported, I can see. but. Um, you know, nations have ways of apologizing, and uh, uh, through through actions of uh, that have the effect of saying, "We never did it. We didn't mean to do it, and we're never going to do it again." <laughs> okay, thank you. I uh, just encourage you, if you do have a question, please do uh, email it into us or use the chat function to do so. And follow up on um, on Kay Song, Mark, and very uh, very interesting what you were saying about about the the risk. Um, that South Korea might use it, in effect, to infect North Korea um, and undermine the internal cohesion. At the same time, there are obvious economic advantages to going down a more reformist route. Um, and they would ease the pressure, arguably might uh, give, give the regime a little more room for maneuver. Do you get any sense that an opening up to China might be more acceptable to the North Korean leadership? Um, well, actually, this is exactly what uh, has been happening and which North Korea very recently uh, said would uh, continue to happen. The, uh, uh, the Chinese have got an open uh, uh, door, uh, well, open door in the sense that there's no, there's no competition. Uh, China is the only game in town in North Korea because South Korea under the previous government and probably continuing now is not uh, uh, going to be uh, investing or trading in North Korea until they take steps uh, toward denuclearization. Uh, but China makes no such uh, conditionality and has uh, immense uh, investment and, uh, and trade. And they do it for their own purposes because they extract a lot of mineral wealth uh, at cheap prices from North Korea. Uh, now, China has had um, the, um, the largest um, 
position in what is uh, now the only remaining of economic uh, free trade zone in North Korea, the Razon uh, area in northern North Korea. But uh, a, a second uh, such free trade zone uh, was recently opened uh, with China. Uh, it was open to great um, uh, bombast in the, in, the, um, in the pages of the North Korean uh, media. But uh, uh, a visitor to that area says that the grass is tall and there's no uh, evident uh, work going on. So, uh, you know, what North Korea says and what it does is often a, a real um, uh, divergence. And for all the, uh, for all the uh, reliance it places on China economically and militarily, North Korea does stuff that uh, uh, really uh, slap China in the face. For example, one of China's major mineral uh, uh, companies had a, a large-scale investment in North Korea that uh, it recently pulled out of because of North Korean behavior of, uh, for example, I mean, you know, from petty things like refusing the Chinese workers access to the ocean even though it was within sight, they couldn't walk and, and, uh, and swim in the ocean, and um, confiscation of, of Chinese uh, machinery, and uh, incessant demands on China for uh, bribes, it, it bribes not just money, but uh, you know, uh, unsavory bribes, including women and so forth. And then, um, uh, in other ways, uh, I mentioned in, in my opening remarks how uh, North Koreans seized a Chinese fishing vessel, held it for two weeks. Now, who exactly seized it isn't clear. Uh, North Koreans in, in some form of uniform, um, who seem to be from the military, they might have been a rogue um, soldiers or, 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 or sailors, but um, if they were, then this represents a breakdown in authority in North Korea. If, and if they weren't rogue, if they really were with the military, this represents a state-authorized uh, um, uh, attack uh, on, on their ally. So the, China has ample reason to be frustrated with North Korea. Well, regarding the, the reform agenda of, of the reformist prime minister that, that Kim appointed, what are the flags that you are looking for? What are the, are the things that you uh, would look to that he might do that would suggest to you that actually he was making some sort of headway? Yeah, um, you know, um, it's one thing to announce policies, it's another thing to carry them out. So one would be looking for um, any, any announced change of policy and one would have to try to uh, uh, read the, uh, the tea leaves because uh, any policies that of change are not going to be uh, they're not going to be labeled economic reform they're going to be uh, you know spoken of in terms of improving um, output uh, but there have been certain signals of such changes already even before this new reformist prime minister came on board last summer in uh, uh, policy enunciated on June 28th and hence called the 28th June uh, policy, uh, North Korea uh, uh, regime said that uh, henceforth um, the, uh, the size of uh, farming units would be reduced to uh, 10 or 20, which could be the size of a family rather than the large collective farms. And that additionally, uh, farmers would be able to retain more of the uh, produce for their own purposes, in other words, uh, private uh, sector farming. That was a, a big uh, change. There were other uh, similar kind of changes announced in the industrial sector, um, although not as, not as clearly spelled out. But so far there's been no evidence that any of this has actually eventuated. Uh, reporters who have talked with North Korean farmers uh, <laughs> say things like, um, uh, the farmer says, yes, uh, we, were, we were told we could keep more of, of the of the, of the uh, harvest, but we gave it to the state as a form of our, <laughs> to show our loyalty. <laughs> That's touchingly selfless, Mark. Yes. Um, a question on, on coming back to um, um, the nuclear aspect. Um, why so much, it might seem quite counterintuitive because missiles is the standard way to go. But for a country that's demonstrated an inter interest in asymmetric responses, um, why place so much emphasis on missiles when there might be other 
more technologically achievable uh, methods of delivery that they could use, whether it be fast patrol craft and the like. Or do you think that's going on in, in, in perhaps in parallel? Well, there are various um, avenues of, of asymmetry that North Korea is employing. And missiles actually are uh, asymmetrical in terms of, of South Korea's uh, missile capabilities. Uh, South Korea is or has been until recently held to a, uh, a global standard uh, under the missile technology control regime of not having missiles that have a capability to fly beyond 500 kilometers um, carrying a 300 uh, kilogram uh, warhead. Um, or is it the reverse? <laughs> uh, but North Korea has no such constraints and, uh, and has, um, you know, as I said, uh, missiles that uh, may fly up to 4,000 kilometers and uh, working on uh, systems that may have an intercontinental uh, reach. The UNHA-3 uh, that was successfully launched on the 12th of December carrying a satellite. Uh, put the satellite in the air, it didn't function as a satellite, it was wobbly and did not transmitting anything, but uh, North Korea had a success there. Now, um, they do this uh, for several reasons. One is they see the United States as the enemy, and uh, so missile systems and nuclear weapons, strategic systems that could hit the United States uh, are a way of deterring the United States. Uh, a way of, of uh, in a sense, uh, demonstrating some equality uh, with the United States. Secondly, they're a way of demonstrating uh, power, uh, of demonstrating achievement, technological achievement. Um, North Korea is far behind South Korea in every other form of, of uh, human achievement and endeavor, in every economic strata, in every um, civilian, uh, industrial, and technological area. Of, uh, South Korea is world-renowned for its uh, uh, bio, uh, biometrics, for its um, nanotechnology, uh, for its culture, cultural exports. Um, but uh, in the field of missiles and uh, nuclear weapons, North Korea can boast of something. Uh, missiles are also um, it's, a, it's probably a hangover from the Soviet system. Uh, Nick, as a, as a former, as, as, as a Soviet expert, you know that uh, one thing the Soviets could do very well was produce missiles. And they produced hundreds and thousands of them. And, and that's, uh, uh, so, so, South Korea, uh, so North Korea learned this from the Soviet Union, and they were able to acquire a lot of uh, extra missiles uh, from the Soviet system, particularly uh, after the collapse of the of Soviet Union, and there were uh, avenues of, uh, of money to be made in selling such cast-off equipment. So there's one uh, field of, 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 um, of thought that, that thinks that North Korea actually hasn't developed so many missiles on its own, but it's, it's been using a lot of, of old Soviet missiles. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, no question about the Japanese and U.S. reaction to events of the past few months. Do you think this has informed their policy at all? Do you think this is, uh, have there been any signs of any changes? I mean, they seem to adopt quite a, a reserved position, at least to, to, to my eyes. Is that your reading? Um, well, the, the, um, all of uh, North Korea's adversaries, uh, South Korea, United States, and Japan, are pretty firm in not bending to blackmail, uh, insisting on denuclearization and uh, real steps uh, that would demonstrate uh, a, a commitment uh, to uh, denuclearization. Now, that does not mean that these states are, uh, re are um, unwilling to engage with North Korea. Last year, the United States famously uh, struck a deal with North Korea the deal struck on the 29th of February, the Leap Day deal of, uh, of providing 240,000 uh, tons of nutritional assistance in exchange for moratoria in nuclear testing missile launches and uranium enrichment. Uh, that famously uh, came undone when North Korea uh, disagreed on the meaning of uh, long-range missile launches and uh, went ahead, uh, announced a, a space launch and then went ahead with it. It failed in April. They got neither 
of the, the benefits of the launch or the benefits of the deal. But the point is, in, in response to this question, the United States has engaged North Korea uh, and, uh, and, and carried out um, um, secret talks. They may, I think they probably are willing to do that again after a certain low. Uh, they don't want to respond immediately, uh, lest North Korea get the idea that it was in response to these provocations. That's one reason uh, President Obama is not going to follow Dennis Rodman's advice and, and call Pyongyang. But I think other um, senior officials in the Obama administration at some point in the next couple of years will do so. Now, Japan. Japan has had its own secret diplomacy with North Korea. Very inter interestingly, a uh, trusted advisor of Prime Minister Abe, Mr. E. Jima, suddenly appeared in Pyongyang, uh, being interviewed by Asahi Shimbun, uh, and uh, nobody uh, knew, uh, nobody outside Abe's circle knew that he was going to Pyongyang. He was there to try to uh, restructure uh, talks addressing Japan's gravest concern, the abduction issue, the um, dozen or maybe dozens of Japanese citizens who were abducted by uh, North Korea last century, uh, for whom Japan wants an accounting and a return of any who still are alive. Um, that is a, a signature policy initiative, of uh, a signature policy issue of uh, Prime Minister Abe, and uh, he deployed Mr. E. G. to see if something could get going. It was a surprise uh, for several reasons, uh, including uh, why North Korea would go along with this since the, uh, host uh, the, the um, kidnapping issue has been such a, uh, um, you know, a sensitive issue. Uh, Kim uh, Jong-il had agreed to um, agree with former Prime Minister Koizumi to uh, settle this issue by uh, allowing seven of the uh, former uh, kidnapped uh, Japanese to return to Japan, uh, but uh, uh, then there was no follow-up in terms of uh, additional ones, and the, the bones that were turned over turned out not to be Japanese citizens, and, uh, and a lot of uh, lies were exposed. So it's a very sensitive issue, and the North Koreans uh, thinking that well, Kim Jong-il had settled it and Japan still wants something, it's, they're, they're not so eager to go along. The other reason it was surprising is because uh, Japan didn't tell <laughs> its allies uh, about this initiative and it, um, it perturbed both South Korea and the United States. Now, I think it's, you know, out of fairness, one might point out that neither did the United States tell Japan when a secret White House emissaries went to North Korea reportedly last August, um, but um, but Japan did not express any public displeasure at that. I've, I've heard some private uh, expressions of displeasure, but they're too diplomatic to say. Okay, thank you. We do have a little more time left, so I encourage anyone who is wondering whether or not to pose a question, pose it now. On South Korean perceptions particularly, Mark, do you think this has uh, changed in any sense uh, the new president's approach and more generally not just about about what's happened this year generally how do South Koreans think this is going to end uh -huh. well um, Mrs. Park uh, has not um, um, given up her trust uh, politique she has uh, laid out a three-step process of engagement with North Korea uh, beginning with um, humanitarian aid, uh, untied. Um, there was a, a second step of uh, further aid, and a third step would be a massive uh, cooperation if North Korea uh, took steps on the nuclear front. Now, um, implementation of this plan is has been delayed because of North Korea's provocations, but it's still on the books, and I think uh, we will see in the upcoming uh, year some some movement forward. And I, I expect there will be some secret uh, engagement between North and South Korea. There, there, there has been so often in the past that uh, uh, it's, it would be surprising if it didn't uh, ensue again. Uh, how do the South Koreans see uh, this all um, ending? There are two very divergent schools of thought in South Korea. Schools of thought associated 
um, with the uh, sunshine policy of uh, President um, No Myun Hyun and of the um, uh, demand for reciprocity policy of uh, the former President Lee Myung Bak and uh, the conservatives who uh, are still in power. Uh, Lee Myung uh, Bak had uh, a vision of unification. Well, all, all Koreans have a vision of unification, maybe a different vision that some of them have. His vision was that, uh, I think the proper one was that uh, eventually the government in Seoul will be running uh, the, the land north of the border. It will be one unified Korea under uh, a government that is uh, democratic, and has a free enterprise system, and the government will be based in Seoul. And that uh, the government in Seoul should prepare for that day and uh, start to uh, build up a rainy day fund uh, for that purpose. Um, this uh, idea of unification um, does not actually in practice sit so well with many in, in the South uh, who know how hard it was for Germany, how uh, costly for Germany, and how tremendously more costly it will be for uh, South Korea given the disparity in wealth, income, and, uh, and everything else um, between uh, North and, and South Korea. So there's an alternative um, view of the future of um, and you might associate it more with the sunshine policy of a continuation of of two systems uh, who may be united in 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 some ways, but uh, in a confederation perhaps, and who um, during a process of gradual of uh, coming together will uh, have economic exchanges, will have people to people exchanges, which will break down North Korean animosity and distrust. Um, and that uh, this is the only way forward. And there's still a large uh, body of people in, in South Korea who adhere to this, um, notwithstanding the failures of the Sunshine Policy to elicit any change in North Korean policies. Mm -hmm. right, we have a question mark from uh, Furong He. What is the prospect of reactivating six-side talks in the near future? Yes, the six-party talks uh, have been on hold for two years or so, and they're likely to remain on hold for the foreseeable future uh, unless um, the United States, Japan, and South Korea um, sharply change their policy. Their policy of strategic patience is that uh, talks should not uh, be continued for the sake of talks. The talks need to be tied to policy uh, changes of North Korea. That North Korea needs to recommit to the denuclearization goal that they signed up to in an important um, uh, deal under the Six-Party Talks of 19 September 2005. And that in addition to um, signing up again to denuclearization, that, that North Korea should take steps uh, to show they mean it. Steps including uh, stopping the enrichment uh, program at Yongbyon. North Korea is going the opposite direction by restarting, by, by not stopping the enrichment program and by restarting the plutonium program uh, that will give it uh, two paths to a nuclear weapon. Uh, so um, I don't think uh, uh, six-party talks are likely to um, eventuate uh, soon, but that's not the only venue, the only forum for diplomacy. As I mentioned, the United States had secret talks with North Korea. Uh, Japan has uh, begun some. South Korea is likely to have some as well. And in these secret talks, it's a way to explore ideas uh, off the record. And uh, maybe something would come of such talks that then could uh, uh, be more formalized in a, in a formal diplomatic form. It doesn't necessarily need to be six parties, although that seems to be a, a number that works well, but it could be four or, or some other number. Mark, final one from me. You and I are just about to go to the Shangri-La Dialogue, a week away from now. Um, North Korean Defense Minister, as we know, is not going to be there. If he was, what is the question that you would ask him? And what would be the motivation? What would you be, what was the answer that you would be looking for? Um, it's unfortunate that North Korea will not be represented 
in Singapore at the IISS Forum. It's the only Asian country that won't be there, that hasn't ever been there. Uh, we've invited them many times, uh, unofficially and officially, but they are not a country that is very interested in engaging with the international community. But if they were there, I think I might pose the question about the guns and butter contradiction. Uh, and I would, you don't want to put a question that would put somebody on the spot, but that would uh, give uh, the minister a, a way of, of elaborating on a stated policy in ways that uh, might nudge it along in a, in a good direction. And the question might be something like, um, the uh, party meeting in, in April uh, spoke of the missile and nuclear programs as uh, um, allowing economic development to prosper, um, as, a, as a, not something that was um, uh, sustain, not just a, a sustainable, but that would actually complement and, uh, and, and produce more economic development. And I would try to phrase a question along the lines of, uh, are you out of your mind? <laughs> no, it would be, uh, how, how could this, how could, how could you actually do that? And maybe would there be a way of, of, of promoting economic development um, by uh, accepting um, the September 19, 2005 denuclearization agreement uh, that then would allow for um, others to work with North Korea in the prosperity of the country. Mark, uh, thank you very much. Our time has just about run out, so I wanted to thank you very much uh, for your presentation and for a fascinating discussion. I want to thank those who joined us for, for doing so and staying with us to the end. Um, next month we will have a, a webinar. Our, one of our colleagues, Antonio Sampaio, will talk about the first signs of potentially a spring in, uh, in Venezuela, at least with the, the early moves of the post-Chavez administration. Uh, all that remains for me is to say thank you very much, Mark, and I hope you'll join us again in a month. You're welcome.